This forms one of two videos that are planned on the topic of two-dimensional mappings, so mappings of the form that you see here. You can either think of xn plus 1 and yn plus 1 as being the output of a vector-valued function, bolded f, or you can think of xn plus 1 given by some scalar function f and yn plus 1 given by a scalar function g. Visually, imagine this as a mapping that sends points in the plane to another point, so here the white point to the yellow point, and you can also visualize the effect on mappings on sets. So for example, here f stretches the initial circle u to an ellipse f of u. Now one question you might have is, why introduce this so near to the end of the course? I have two reasons for that. The first is that although this course was steeped in learning about concepts of chaos for one-dimensional maps, concepts like sensitive dependence on initial conditions, topological transitivity, we would eventually move to a definition of chaos that was largely topological. Here, chaos was defined in terms of the existence of so-called horseshoe structures in f to the n. These horseshoe structures don't depend on studying maps on the real line, but rather only depend on establishing covering structures in the map. We also discussed how this is related to stretching and folding. So the idea of thinking about things in a two-dimensional setting is quite natural given the development of the course. The second reason why we should have a look at two-dimensional mappings is because they provide a very nice playground for visualizing mappings. When we think of how chaos appears in a mixing process, for instance, we're naturally thinking about two-dimensional dynamics. The key, then, is that in this last topic on two-dimensional mappings, we don't really have to work with the precise definitions of the maps f and g. Instead of thinking quantitatively, we can think qualitatively and visually and try to connect the dynamics of 2D maps in a more intuitive way with concepts we've already learned. Let's start with a concrete problem and discuss the questions that appear on the 2018-19 exam regarding the Baker's map. First, the question. Let a be less than half. The Baker's map, b, of the square xy in 0, 1 to itself is described as follows. First, the square is stretched and flattened into a 2 by a rectangle. Second, this rectangle is cut in half, yielding two 1 by a rectangles. And third, the right half is then stacked on top of the left half, such that its base is at the level y equal to a half. Then you have the two questions. The first question asks, let lambda be the invariant set for the map B. By drawing a series of illustrations of the unit square, explain what the points of lambda resemble. What does this have to do with the Cantor set? The second question asks, do you think this map B is chaotic? Briefly justify your answer. In fact, this question is a pretty common question in many references on dynamics and chaos. And if you want further reading, you can consult with Stephen Strogatz's famous book, Nonlinear Dynamics and Chaos. I'm going to walk you through what Strogatz discusses about the map, and then we'll come back to the exam question and discuss what typical responses students might have written. The mapping is illustrated as follows. You begin with the unit square. I color the unit square here two different colors so you can distinguish the left and right parts. First, you stretch the horizontal by a factor of 2 and squash the vertical by a factor of a, which will be less than a half. Then you cut the result along the horizontal and stack the right piece over the left piece. The stacking is done at a height of a half, so there will be points here, specifically in white, that do not have a pre-image. These two actions form one iteration of the map, so action 1, stretch and flatten, action 2, cut and stack. The question is to now ask yourself what happens when you do this over and over. As we said earlier, it isn't necessary to examine the analytical details of the map, but if you wanted to, you could write out the precise details. Here's the map as shown in Strogatz's book, which he calls B. Anyways, you can see what happens here after another iteration. Take S, the unit square, and apply B to it and now the square has been mapped to these two shaded strips, both of height a. 
apply the map again, take this picture, flatten it by a factor of A, and then cut it along the center and stack. You should now obtain the center picture, hence four strips of height A squared. The procedure continues so that for B cubed of S, we now have eight horizontal strips of height A cube. Let us now return to the original question, which asked the student to draw a series of illustrations showing the convergence of the mapping procedure to the invariant set, and we have just done that. The question also asks to explain what this has to do with the Cantor set, and so I'll give the technical answer here. We have already established that b to the n of s consists of 2 to the n strips of height a to the n. Let lambda be the limiting set b infinity of s. Then lambda is a Cantor set. You can make this rigorous and show that lambda does exist. For each n, note that b to the n of s is a closed, non-empty set with b to the n plus 1 of s, a subset of b to the n of s. So if we let lambda be the infinite intersection of all the bn of s's, then by the Cantor intersection theorem, lambda is non-empty. So that concludes the first part of the question. Next, it asks you whether you think the Baker map is chaotic. The map is indeed chaotic, and one of the signatures you can observe is the fact that the map exhibits sensitive dependence on initial conditions through this procedure of stretching and folding, or in this case, stacking. However, I'll give a more technical answer which will hopefully convince you. What you can do is establish a system of symbolic dynamics on the map. Let the bolded x be a point in the invariant set, and let's associate this point x with a symbol sequence. So here we've written x as a0, a1, a2, and so forth. Now for the ith symbol ai, you would set it to be equal to zero if the ith iteration of b sends x to the lower stack or you set it to equal 1. So now you have the shift map sigma defined on the symbol sequences of two elements, the binary sequences. And assuming you have conjugacy with the Baker map, we know that sigma exhibits all the usual markers of chaos. In particular, we know that sigma allows for all possible cycle lengths by the usual proof. And by a theorem in the course, the existence of a three cycle implies chaos. For the exam, the students weren't expected to write as much detail for this part of the question, which is only worth three points, but you can have a look at the exam solutions for an idea of what was expected of students to write.